I mean, there aren't there are not many singers in the world that can match Tony Harnell, and I'm certainly not one of them. Tony, are you there? Hello, hello. Good, good. Hope I'm not uh, interrupting anything at the moment. No, I'm in the middle of studying opera at the moment. <laughs> studying opera? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm doing an opera album at the moment. So. That's, that's a little bit of a standard deviation away from your usual uh, metal stuff that you yeah, do. Yeah, you've got to do some things for yourself sometimes, you know. Well, you can't do it every day, right? <laughs> yeah. You can't all be heavy metal all the time. <laughs> <laughs> So where are you, in Toronto? Uh, in Windsor, Canada. Uh, it's right next to Detroit. It's a city... Oh, Detroit. Yeah, I've been to Detroit. Yeah, a city of about 5 million people or so. Yeah, I went to a hairdresser's in Detroit. <laughs> there, was, there was 60 black women in there, and I, and I had to go in there and get my blonde touched up. <laughs> so they weren't expecting me at all. That was like in 1986 or something. I can't remember. So 87 or 88 or something. All I remember is this big black woman like, hey, blonde, I love your hair, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was very embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, one of my heroes comes from there, Iggy Pop. Yeah, he's uh, been a great inspiration to me for years. He's completely crazy, obviously. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll but, say. Uh, but nevertheless, that's probably half of the attraction link. <laughs> Have you, uh, have you seen him live? Oh, he's awesome. Awesome. And I went to see him with David Barry. With, uh, David Barry was playing keyboards for him. And, um, and I guess I was just a young kid at the time. And, um, and I got hold of the end of his mic lead. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, man, if you don't let go of that lead, I'm going to kick your fucking head in. <laughs> so I let go of it. And he fell back on his back. <laughs> <laughs> I shot my claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> he was cool. He was really cool. Well, he's still really, he's still cool. So. Well, first thing uh, I think is <laughs> the most uh, important thing to ask is, Tony, can you explain to the listeners who you are and just drop a couple of names for us, sort of plug, you know, what you're doing now. Uh, but it, let's, let, let's hear a basic introduction. Okay. Um... Well, I'm Tony Mills, and um, I've been singing with a band called Shy for uh, many years, since the 80s, um, and uh, that all sort of fell out of bed uh, around about 1990, and um, we all sort of fell out with each other a little bit, so I, I went away and got a record deal on my own, uh, and I did a solo album called Cruiser, and then put this band together, Siam, which sort of went for about four or five, six years through the 90s. Did some touring with Crown of Thorns, um, and then uh, then the grunge thing kicked in in the late nineties, and that sort of uh, put a lot of the rock business to bed in in, in England. Um, and then uh, later on, I did a couple more albums with Shy. I, I think we've done about twelve albums now, or something with Shy, and. Um, and then uh, I sort of did lots of session work for many years. And uh, since then, I've been working with TNT in Scandinavia for now nearly four years, uh, which is a... <laughs> that's a party, I'll tell you. <laughs> I um, can only bet. Oh, you don't want to know. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, doing gigs outside in minus 28 degrees, yeah, that's a laugh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we've been playing with Ozzy Osbourne and uh, Motorhead and Skid Row and, and stuff like that. Oh, there we go. Yeah, Skid Row are awesome. Um, in fact, I was the guy that um, told the English press when Skid, were, Skid Row first were uh, first came out that they rang me up in LA and, and asked me what's the news in LA and I said Skid Row and they went oh well who's that and I went you are not going to believe it but he's coming to England oh wow <laughs> and, <it's, laughs> and it was true enough I mean Sebastian Bach is he's awesome oh yeah and um but yeah I mean uh, since since uh, over the last few years I've been working with China Blue from Los Angeles uh, Eric Ragno and um Josh Ramos oh, Takura, yeah. and um I've the last few months I've been doing some albums in Europe with Robbie Bobell from Frontline and uh, and some other English bands, Serpentine and um, and lots of different stuff and uh, I'm doing the, 
what might be probably the the final album from Shy. Um, I'm working on at the moment. Uh, oh but, no, no, don't say that. Well, I, 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 you know, I mean, um, the guitarist has been really, really unwell. He's been sick, so um, uh, but he's uh, but he's finished a, a superb record, I have to say. And so I'm finished. I'm I'm sort of halfway through writing that at the moment, and um, uh, we'll see how that goes. I guess that'll pretty much. As soon as it's finished, it'll get snapped up and released in Europe and Japan. And um, uh, because he has written a great record, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and I've got to, to start a new album with TNT in January. Um, and doing some other different things like opera and, <laughs> and things like that, which I know is a bit crazy, but it's uh, a passion of mine. So that's uh, you. You singing uh, any any Italian for this? I can't speak it, but I can sing it. <laughs> are you uh, is, are, are you going to sing that in? Uh, yes, it's all classic Italian opera. Yes, so yes. It's all all, all going to be completely Italian then. All class, like no metal, all classical style. Yeah, the album will be called uh, Classic Arias. Yeah, there's um, there's a header track already mastered and and published on MySpace on the on the MySpace site. Um, so if anybody fancies to listen to that, Nessun Dormo from uh, from um, Turandot, which is one of Puccini's operas, then uh, then they can listen to that. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Well, let's send people there. MySpace dot com slash Tony Mills Rocks. We'll we'll uh, we'll definitely have to make sure we play some of that before the uh, the show is done. Yeah, sure thing. It's, it's funny. What one of the bands that I probably got the most questions about out of everything was Cinderella. Uh, everybody wants to know how that came about. Sort of, you know. I, th- I think it was your biggest record. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, stateside, anyways. <laughs> That's one of my smallest records, actually, and one that I one that I'd really like to forget. But uh, working with Tom Kiefer was really good. He was a very clever guy. Um, something that I really didn't expect. I was I was I was doing some writing and recording with Jeff Paris in Los Angeles, and um, he was due to do some vocal sessions uh, on their album, and he couldn't make it. So he said, "Can you go down and stand in for me?" And I said, "Well, yeah, if you want me to, I don't, you know, I don't mind." And uh, so I went down there, and um, Andy Johns was producing the album, um, but he was like, um, he was asleep on the floor actually when I got there. So Tom Kiefer, so Tom Kiefer was like running this massive SSL desk in in the record plant in Los Angeles, and. Um, <laughs> and he just said, can you sing all these? Yeah, yeah, I can do it. Yeah, yeah, that's not a problem. I can sing all that. So, did a load of that. And, uh, and then, uh, I sort of, I sat back for a while and I thought, hmm, I don't know what good this is going to do me, actually. And I said, do you want, do you want, do you want the cash? Or do you want a credit and a percentage on the album? I said, man, I thought to myself, a band with a name called Cinderella? Uh, I don't think you're going anywhere at all. Um, and not only that, it just sounds like ACDC to me. So I'll take the cash. So they said, well, he's 150 bucks, okay? And I said, yeah, I'll take the 150 bucks. And they said, it's either that or we give you a quarter of a percent, a percent on the album. Uh, and I said, no, I'll take the cash, thanks. So And then they sold 8 million albums. And I was like, really pissed. <laughs> So, so I got the hundred and fifty bucks. <laughs> the classic disaster of my life. <laughs> but it's but Tom was great, and um, I still love the band very much, and uh, uh, and I'm really glad that they did as well as they did. You know. So. Did you um uh did you record this while you were doing? Excess All Areas? Was that what you, you guys were on tour in the States? Yeah, that's when uh, I was over there writing that record, I think. And um, I worked, like I said, with Jeff Paris and Michael Thompson and um, Dwayne Hitchings, who, who wrote for um, Rod Stewart. And I worked with uh, Chicago. And um, Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, that was pretty cool. I mean, the guy that wrote The Hard Habit to Break... Um, you know, and uh, lots of um, lots of famous people over there, Dokken and um, well, Don he uh, he, he wrote uh, uh, "Tear Down the Walls," didn't he? Break down the walls. Uh, yeah. He, well, no, he just co-wrote "Break Down the Walls." He, 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 I mean, there are so many stories about that guy. You know, I mean, 
the record company paid him a thousand bucks, I think, to um, oh, wow. just come and sit and co-write with me for the day, and um, and he and he didn't turn up, and um, uh, I mean, uh, sat in his, he was only working one studio, which was Total Access in Redondo Beach. Uh, so um I turned up at Redondo Beach at ten o'clock in the morning and no sign of Don Darkin. And um and then like three hours later he turns up on this big Harley Davidson and he said, Man, I'm sorry, I trashed my chopper on the freeway and I was like oh, Are you okay? What you've had a you crashed your bike? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, I I I fucking totaled my chopper on the freeway and I went well, are you, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. So I went outside and there was this immaculate Harley Davidson outside. And I said, well, there's, uh, there's no damage to the bike. Yeah, well, I punched the tank back out and straightened the forks on the side of the road. And I went, dude, there's nothing wrong with this bike at all. It's, it's absolutely stunning. He said, yeah, do you want to buy it? And I said, no, I don't want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, but he used to be a Swedish car salesman. So he's like got this car salesman thing about him, and he's, uh, you know, and I was like, dude, can we just get on with writing the song, you know? And um, so then we sat down and we wrote Break Down the Walls off the Excess All Areas album, and um, and when six o'clock came, um, that was the time he was due to stop working, and sure enough, um, the uh, all the power was switched off and everybody left, and I was like, but we're only halfway through the song. No, nope, time's up, gone. And and he left, and that was it. <laughs> so when we, when we took, uh, he wasn't even called um, Break Down the Walls. It, it was originally called Last Chance, which was... Oh, okay. So it was a, a completely different track. But when we took the uh, the track to the producer in Holland, which was Neil Kernan, uh, one, of the, one of the guys that... Did, oh, Neil! Neil Kernan, yeah, he produced Under Lock and Key. Yeah, and... Uh, uh, and, and with, with Michael Wagner. Yeah, Qu- Queensryche, Rage for Order. That's right. He, uh, Rage for Order was awesome. Well, well, actually, when we finished recording in Holland, um, Queensryche was supporting Bon Jovi in London, and uh, I went backstage with Neil Kernan to meet Jeff Tate. That must have been awesome. And, um, and Queensryche absolutely blew Bon Jovi clear off the stage. There was no doubt about that. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, and I mean, Neil, well, Neil Kernan, when he heard the docking track, he said, this is shit. <laughs> but what we'll do is we'll keep the guitar riff and scrap the rest of the track because it's so, so we actually completely rewrote the track with, with the producer and, uh, and most of Dockin's work was got, they got rid of it, you know, so, because they didn't think it was very good, really. So, yeah. But yeah, I mean, um, those years in the late eighties, um, we toured with Meatloaf and um, Bon Jovi and Gary Moore and um, many other acts throughout Europe. Um, but we played it, when we when we toured in America. It was it was with very different bands. It was like um, must have been all like hair metal and stuff. Uh, Enough's enough and uh, the Sleaze Bees and Gun and um, and. Uh, Badlands. Oh, there we go. Um, and bands like that. So, but uh, we used to do a lot of gigs on our own when the other band singer did, had lost his voice or whatever. We used to, we used to cover all the concerts. And we, and we spent many, many months traveling backwards and forwards from LA to Florida and then back to LA and back to Florida. And so, um, that was quite a heavy time really. And uh, I think we were quite tired by the time we got home. Um, Around 1990. I can imagine touring that long. Uh, but have you uh, have, have you been to the states since? I have not. Uh, no, I haven't been back to America since then. No, I, I miss it very much. Have you had any offers to go back? Like, would would you want to go back, or, or are you just happy staying in England? Or you know, I mean, even recently, um, I was asked if we could play in uh, Florida, and um, of course, I went uh, immediately. Yes. Um, but then the guitarist was taken ill, so I had to cancel like loads of concerts that we booked. So uh, I, there's a question mark hanging over that still, and I don't know where that's going at the moment. So, okay, so now, um, uh, well, if you don't mind, if we uh, switch gears for a second, go to TNT. Yeah, sure thing. The first question I really want to ask, and um, 
is how how did this all happen? I mean, I know it was through like a record label got in touch, but what's what's sort of the the backstory behind all that? Okay, well that's pretty easy. Um, I had a phone call from a record company that I was involved with in England. Um, only a small company, but they had released it. Was that uh, Z- sorry? Was that Z Records? Z Records, yeah, Z Z Records, Z Records. Um, they're only a small outfit, but they had been connected with TNT for one of the releases. And um and I'd I'd released some product through them as well. And um I got a phone call and it said um um Tony Harnell had left um TNT and would I be interested in the job? And I was like, uh wow, uh I don't know, I need to think about that. Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I I got a concert to do in Berlin with Shy. And, um, they put me in touch with, with Ronnie Letecro. Um, so I went to Berlin, uh, and did this terrible concert, which was terribly organized with terrible sound and, and it was just a disaster really, to be honest. So I was like very embarrassed really. But, um, they sort of stood there and, and while I was halfway through the show, they all walked out and I thought, this isn't good at all. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, oh dear. After the gig, somebody, the tour manager or someone came to me outside in the hotel bar and said, like, do you want to come up and meet TNT? And I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So I went up and they went, yes, we thought you did a great job under terrible circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> I said, thanks a lot. And they said, welcome to our hellhole. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh dear. <laughs> Here we go. And that was nearly four years ago now. So, um, well, it'd be four years in May. Uh, so we've done about 200 concerts across Scandinavia now. Holy and cow. we're just about to start the third album together. And, uh, it's, yeah, they're crazy. They're pretty crazy people, actually. So how, how, how has it been working with Ronnie? Like, do you get input into the process or what's, uh, what's, what's it been like with Ronnie so far? I've lived with him. <laughs> <laughs> I've lived with it. He's had about three different wives since I've known him. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> no, and you know, and I mean, um, he's very rock and roll. Uh, you know, for some, for I mean, he's the same age as me, and um, he's got lots of children, and he's he's just very rock and roll, and uh, he's a great guitar player. He's really off the wall, um, but then that's what you expect from artistic. Uh, you know, people that are he's classed as like um, what are what are they calling? He, he's he's just very he's a very very private man. Um, but um, when he's in public, he's uh, he's a brilliant personality, and uh, he just he's, he comes out with so many unexpected things uh, on live TV and and all the rest of it. When we do a lot of live TV in Scandinavia. Uh, so then TNT is, they're, they're sort of an institution in Norway. Uh, very much so. Uh, the, well, they're the biggest rock band in Norway, certainly. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, certainly. I mean, Norway only has four million people. But, um, you know, I mean, we play to two and a half to three thousand people a night. And That's a lot I of people. Think, yeah, yeah, I mean, they're very big in, in I keep saying they, it's, it's, it even took me four years to say we. Uh, well, TNT as a band are without doubt the biggest band in Norway. And I mean, we've been playing, we've played to 30,000 people in Oslo. When we played with Ozzy Osbourne at uh, Trondheim Football Stadium, um, I think there were 17,000 people there. And when we finished our show, 8,000 people left and they didn't bother to watch Oh, the come on. And I couldn't believe that. They just left. <laughs> they just left. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's how big TNT are in their own domestic market. So, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, they got a lot of respect there. And um, if it's, I spend quite a lot of time doing like live TV at like four o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the morning and, and things like this. I mean, you, oh. you really don't look your best, you know. And and, uh, and not only that, but you've probably already done a concert the night before as well. And a lot of the live concerts in Norway, they don't. 
you don't go on stage till one or two in the morning. Oh, that's really late. That's later in North America. Yeah, and I mean, we've, we've started gigs at three in the morning. And um, for, for like 10,000 people, we played with the Beach Boys last month. That's a pretty cool bill. It was tricky, yeah. And um, and I, we weren't even advertised. TNT weren't even on the posters or the photographs or or, the, or on or on anything. And the Beach Boys were playing live on stage, and there was two big stages. And um, halfway through the set, as soon as they put the TNT backdrop up on the other stage, everybody left the Beach Boys stand, uh, the Beach Boys stage and came over to stand in front of the TNT stage, and they sang their asses off all night. And I just, you know, I mean, I have to hand it to Ronnie Latecro, really, because whatever he's done over the last 25 years, he's done it right, you know, because there's plenty of gold and silver platinum discs all over the studio everywhere, and, you know, whatever he's done, he's done a good job. So, I'll say. There you go. Do you do you guys still uh, insert a lot of old classics back in the set list, or is it predominantly new material? Well, I mean, Caught Between the Tigers. You know, I mean, uh, Intuition, Seven Seas. Yeah, I mean, we. To be honest with you, when we play live concerts, which we do a lot. I mean, we're in Norway and Bulgaria again inside the next few weeks. About eighty percent of the material is all old classic material. We only play about sort of twenty percent new stuff, uh, and you know, uh, and I think a lot of the new material it works well with the young people in in Scandinavia. It doesn't work outside of there. They, they, they don't get it. They don't get it, and I understand that. Uh, I totally understand that. But they do get it in their own home ground. So I mean, it sort of weighs up quite well. That we, I mean, we play stuff like Downhill Racer and uh, As Far As The Eye Can See and Invisible Noise and, 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 and all these other classic TNT tracks. So we, we do about 80% of the old material and uh, and we shift it around to suit each concert, really. So, so you, guys, you guys don't have uh, an established set that you sort of do night after night after night? No, no, not really. It, it changes. Um it changes because, uh, well, the first thing is you've got different set times. So sometimes you you can only play 45 minutes. Sometimes you're expected to do two hours or whatever. And um, so, we, it, you know, we sort of kick off the tracks that we're going to play or we're not going to play before every show, really, in the dressing room. And then uh, we can sort of weigh up what the best thing is to do for, for that specific concert. You know, so that's, that's how it works. Really, it's pretty straightforward, really. Now, Tony, uh, we got to get to a commercial break, and when we come back, I'd like for you to pick uh, pick the song, and I figure since we're talking about TNT, why don't we play a new track off of Atlantis? Uh, would you like to choose one? Oh, now you're asking me. I mean... Um, what about uh, like Peter Sellers, Tango Girl, Hello, Hello? Well, I mean... I, I really liked uh, Peter Sellers, if you want to do that one. Really? Well, this, I mean, like, I gotta, I gotta tell you this, and this will, this will make you laugh, I guess, but, um, when I got to Oslo, and I first heard the idea of this song, um, it was, it was about the size of Peter Sellers' cock, and I said, Ronnie, I cannot sing this. It's, as an Englishman, I would be strung up when I went home if I sang about Peter Sellers' cock, <laughs> so we have to rewrite the song, okay? So I went out and I bought a DVD of Peter Sellers' life story and then I watched and studied that and completely rewrote the lyrics and um, and made the thing more stable, really. because and, and that was a really good example of the Norwegian humour. They thought it was very funny, but, but it wasn't actually tangible. You couldn't, you couldn't actually release it like that because it, uh, it goes beyond humour, if you, if you understand me. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's... It, they might think it's funny, but actually it's not, sort of thing. So, um, so I had to like say, "Whoa, let's slow down here, and we need to readdress this song." And the same thing happened with Tango Girl as well, which we've done TV videos for and whatever else. So, Tony, you guys did uh, Atlantis, and before that, you did the New Territory. Um, when it came to recording, were you given any input into the process, and how was that working with Ronnie Latecro? Well, I had to go to Spain. And um, Ronnie's got a, a, a home in Spain, 
um, where he, he does a lot of the right... Because when the summer gets bad... Uh, sorry, when the weather gets bad uh, in Norway, he goes to Spain uh, because it's much warmer down there. And uh, so he does quite a lot of writing at his home in Spain. So uh, I fly over to Spain... And uh, and then we sit down and we and we flick through the ideas down there before we come back to Oslo and um, and and start the recording there. And uh, so uh, being well, I'm not n- I'm not nervous about writing or recording really. It's, it doesn't really that's that's not really an issue. It's it's like whether actually how you can approach it and whether it suits you yeah. um, and how how well you can perform it and, and what the final product is at the end of the day. And I mean, on the last album, Atlantis, I went to Oslo. I didn't go to Spain last year. I just went straight to Oslo. And, um, and I thought, hmm, some of these songs are not good at all. Uh, and uh, and it, of course he didn't understand why because he's Norwegian and he was trying to sing ideas and songs in Norwegian that didn't really work in English. And so I was like, uh, you can't do this because it's it doesn't work. And the the English and the Americans or the English and American speaking world, if you like, they won't get it. So it has to be rewritten. It has to be scrapped and rewritten. And the songs that I wrote are the only songs that we play live. We don't play the rest of the record um, because they were all pretty much predominantly Norwegian ideas. So, And you have to sort of understand that. It's, it's a little bit difficult to weigh up. But, um, but the Scandinavians, uh, there are, they are very much people of their own and uh, other people don't get it. Yeah. You know, the, the humour... Um, some of the humour in the rock and roll, so that they're almost some of the songs were almost like a Norwegian Aerosmith, you know, with the bounce and the humour, but it didn't work because it was Scandinavian, so it had to translate into English and American to make it work, and even then it only really worked in Scandinavia. It didn't work outside the country. Nobody really liked the albums, um, but they did there. You know, they they sold all the records and they and they sold out all the concerts in Scandinavia, but they didn't they didn't get well. It's difficult to pull the band out of Scandinavia anyway because it's too expensive. But um, it's very expensive because they won't use anybody else's equipment, and so we have an enormous cost uh, to come out um, for flight uh, to carry all the amps and flight cases and everything else. That's insane. Um, oh yeah, I mean we got like twenty flight cases that. And it's like six thousand bucks just to fly all the gear out, and that's just the weight of the gear, you know. So you can't you, you can't really do it that effectively. And, and Ronnie won't use anybody else's equipment. Uh, you can forget it. He only uses his own gear. Which <laughs> I, I can attest to that. Yeah, totally. You know, I mean, he's he's like got he's got like very private equipment, and he's directly has always been in touch with Marshall and. All the components in his amplifiers he bought the whole stock of in the eighties from Marshall, so that his sound never changes. You know, and I'm, you know, I mean, I mean that's amazing, really. And uh, so, uh, it's practically impossible to get the band out of Norway and Scandinavia. We we get a we get a Sweden every now and again, and next month we got Bulgaria, and we've been to England once, which was a logistical nightmare. Uh, but um, sure of that, um, the band is pretty much isolated to Scandinavia. So, so now is uh, so TNT's doing a new record. Uh, when when does that all kick off? January the tenth, I think, is the um, the studio start date. Yeah. So I've heard we've been listening to and working through some of the songs already. R- very much reminds me of early Queen. It's very clever and. Um, he puts a lot of effort into it, and uh, Ronnie, that is, of course. And what's uh, what's what's the deal? Um, uh, stepping back for a second to Atlantis, what what inspired you guys to write a uh, uh, rock tango tune, uh, Tango Girl? What what's the story with that? Well, I mean, he just wanted to write a rock tango, and I said, "Well, great, do it then." You know, and I mean, since then we we've been on TV with professional dancers doing all this, running around the stage doing tangos and. But the, when you play it live, it bounces so deep that everybody's into it. And people get up on the stage and they start tangoing on the stage with the band and all this business. So, I mean, like, 
well, I guess you did something right there then, you know, because it works. <laughs> so uh, as much as people in England think it's bloody rubbish, they don't in Scandinavia. Okay, now there there was another thing I wanted to ask you about uh, TNT. This was a couple of years ago. You guys were playing a show in Spain. Bain, I believe, if I have this correct, and you guys were actually trapped in an elevator shaft for a couple hours. What what was the deal with that? Well, that was with Shoy, and that was in Madrid, in Spain, which was not very funny at all, actually. Uh, in fact, everything... I mean, this gig was sold out uh, in Madrid. It was a big club, and it was packed, and I mean, you couldn't move. There were that many people in there. And then we went, uh, we did the sound check, we went back to the hotel, got cleaned up. Then we all got in the lift, in the elevator, Mm -hmm. and uh, hit the button, and then the lift jumped down two floors and stopped halfway between between the floors. And there were seven of us in the lift. The only person that wasn't in the lift was the bass player. So then we 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 were stuck, and we were stuck in there for two hours. And then we got um, an engineer to come. Um, you know that button you press on the inside of the lift that says, um, uh, if you need help, press this button? Well, we press this button and we got this woman in Bombay. It <laughs> <laughs> says, can I help you? <laughs> no, we're in, we're in Madrid and you're in Bombay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that eventually we got this engineer to come and this engineer managed to lower the lift to the basement of this hotel, which was a, a relatively new hotel, uh, and then we managed to get the doors open, and we found ourselves in a locked room underneath um, the car parking area, and the lock, it had a door that was locked, and we couldn't get out, and um, we were stuck in this room for another two hours, by which time we should have been on stage. Oh, boy. And uh, nobody had been in this room for many years, three or four years, because all the original decorators and painters' newspapers were there, and you could see the date on the top of the newspapers. It was like three or four years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, we made, we still got our mobile phone, so we rang like, the hotel, and they said, um, we can't, we haven't got the keys to let you out of this room, and the room isn't even on the plans of the building, so nobody has ever been there. Oh, my God. So we were, and then all the mobile phone batteries ran out, so we were stranded completely. And then eventually an engineer turned up about four hours later, and we were in pitch black by now because all the lights had gone out and everything. <laughs> Sounds like the hotel from hell. Uh, and they um, and they they came and sort of rescued us one by one up the elevator. And then when we got to the gig, of course, it was very late and it was absolutely packed. Uh, so after being stuck four hours underground, you know, in, in a garage. <laughs> with a broken elevator, we had to do this gig, <laughs> which was a oh. It was, it was uh, not particularly funny, actually. <laughs> I've forgotten about that. Yeah. Where did uh, where did the idea from "Hello, Hello" come from? That to me is is sort of like uh, uh, TNT's version of the Beatles. Was that an inspiration, or where you know, where where where'd that song come from? I mean, I'm, I wrote all the vocals for that, and that is really sort of a tribute to the Who, actually. Oh really? Oh, very much so. Yes, for 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 the Quadrophenia album. Oh, okay. Yeah, it does have actually a vibe of that. So uh, it was it was all about that and about the mods and the rockers fighting and going down to Brighton and oh, okay. and having all that every year. You know, that's what that was all about. That was the era that Tecro is very obsessed with, which is when the Beatles were predominant in England. Uh, he really does revolve around the Beatles, uh, and so I thought. Okay, well, hmm, I'll write a song about the mods and the rockers then. <laughs> so, hello, hello. Not only was it a tribute to that period, but it was also a shout back to the, the TNT fans that have walked away since I've joined the band and Tony Arnell has left. It was like, hello, hello, hello. How are you? You know, it's good to see you. Come back again, you know. And that's what that's what it was about. And I mean... You want to hear 10,000 people in Scandinavia singing, hello, 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 how are you? Then you've <laughs> got to get on a plane because that's what they do. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, again, it worked again. And uh, <laughs> I was like, well, wow. 
what do you say? You know? so now, do um, do you and Tony Harnell talk at all? Like, is it sort of you took his place and that's it? Or do you, do you guys speak frequently and sort of tell him what's going on with the band? Or what? Um, well, I have. Uh, yes. Well, I've been speaking to him on pretty much a regular basis for the last four years, yeah. So what happened now when you ended up taking his place? Well, Did, uh... he'd already left. Um, he'd already gone after they'd played in Madrid. Um, he went back to America. But then I had to do uh, a concert in Sturstein-S, which is like north of Tromsø, which is up in the Arctic Circle in Norway. And it was a, um, a midnight festival, so it's it's light all all night sort of thing because there's no there's no sundown. Um, and I was doing it with Shy, and I was also doing it with Siam as well. So I got beat. Oh, right, right, right. Yes, I've seen uh, uh, videos of that on YouTube of uh, you guys live of Siam with Winter Strain in Norway. That's right. So the thing is, the freak coincidence was that TNT were booked at the same gig. So I had to do three gigs at the same gig. Uh, and this was the first time I met Tony Harnell. And... Um, uh, I'd already done seven shows with TNT, and then Tony Arnell flew in to do this gig, uh, and 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 say goodbye to the crowd, uh, and and pass me the mic- the microphone as the new vocalist for the band. So it was all a bit trippy, really. So we did that, and um, we sang Harley Davidson together on stage, which he always hated, and but I didn't care anyone. But I think he was expecting us to sing "Everyone's a Star" and. But we didn't do that because Tecra wanted to play Harley Davidson, so that's what we played. And so that was the end of the gig. And then the rest of the band, well, both TNT and Shy, disappeared. And I stayed, I stayed in the Arctic Circle for a few more days because I was doing some recording up there. After that, when I got back to England some time later, we were in touch quite a lot, and we and we have been in touch a lot over the years, and we have got on fine. It's not always been the easiest sort of relationship, obviously, for, for you know, obvious reasons, really. But um, I've always got on pretty well with the guy, and uh, I respect him very much as a vocalist. He's absolutely fantastic. Oh, singer. yeah, incredible singer. Uh, and, I mean, you can't, I mean, there are, there are not many singers in the world that can match Tony Harnell, and I'm certainly not one of them. I'm a very different sort of character. Um, and, uh, I've got, I've got much respect for him. I don't know how, what else to say, what else to tell you, really. You know? It's, it's really funny, though, because a lot of the fans sort of expect you to be rivals with this other guy. And what was really interesting, um, I don't know if you know the band Crimson Glory, but I met Wade Black in Atlanta this September. Oh, well. And he said that, you know, when I took over for Midnight, um, People just naturally expected that we we would hate each other, and that wasn't the case at all. We, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's sort of like you know someone else is coming in and doing your job now. It's sort it just continues. Oh man, I've had so much stuff. Um, you know, I've had I've had to like Tekra. He, he he doesn't really sort of appear on websites very often because he doesn't like the public eye very much. He likes his privacy, and I respect that. So he says, like, can you do the press? Yeah, I'll do the press. No problem, you know. So I'll spend four months doing the press every album we do. And um, I'll get these people on the internet saying, this British wanker, you know, why doesn't he fuck off? And, and I'm thinking, well, hey, you know, um, actually, I'm the guy that's uh, that's looking after the band and, and, and doing all the legwork and the press. And But you come across lots of these people. And um, they're very self-opinionated, and they don't contain themselves very well when they've got access to the internet. They can say what they like, and, and you know it's something you have to deal with. So you deal with it, you know. You know, it's like, yeah. You know, but uh, you get it all the time, and um, you just have to sort of, you just have to sort of sit back and go, hey. <laughs> Right, who are you? Well, yeah. it's it's really that whole sentiment of you're never going to be able to please everyone. I mean, no matter if you're Jeff Tate when he was 25 years old, if you're stepping in for Tony Harnell, it, it, it doesn't matter who you are or what you can do, they want to see the original person. I mean, I think Tommy Thayer does a damn fine Ace Fraley, but people want to see Ace Fraley, so you're, you're always going to have that yeah, sentiment. I'll tell you, you know, the strangest thing 
is that when we go and play a, a concert with TNT in uh, in Norway or Sweden or wherever, um, you see that you, you, all you got to do is look at the audience. You look at the audience, and 50% of them are under 20 years old, and all the guys that were 50 or 40, they're all gone, because we've alienated the old audience by Tony Harnell leaving, and we've brought in a completely new audience that are, that are young people. And uh, and you got a record shop. We, we do we sign um, record sleeves and things at record shops all over the country. And there's a massive queue down the mall, everywhere you go. And they're all kids. <laughs> they're all kids. You know. So I mean, what the band has done in their own domestic territory is that they've updated their own profile for the younger generation, and it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. What can you tell us about your 2008 solo record that you released called Vital Designs? And how did you end up working with uh, Neil Hibbs? Neil's a very close friend of mine now. Um, he's a, a Christian guitarist. What happened was, um, when we were in Norway on tour, uh, we were on the tour bus, and this guy turns up from England, and I'm like, well, who's this guy? And it was this guy called Neil Hibbs, and he's a, a guitar teacher. And he lives in Salisbury, which is in the south of England, a well-known, uh, well, by a big church. And um, I thought, hmm, well, why is this guy here then? And what it was, um, Tecro had a TV program, and they were trying to transpose everything that he plays on guitar so that they could publicize the music format for people to learn what he played on guitar. But Tecro... He wasn't capable of doing it himself, so he had to draft somebody in that could write down the music score of every single note that he played and how he played it and give the public uh, on a website, which was called Rock School or something, um, or the Rock, uh, the, the Guitar Forum or something, I can't remember what it's called. Um, they had to bring somebody in to be able to tell the TV company exactly what Ronnie played and write it all down in proper music format. Yeah. So this guy turns up from England and he's the guy that can do it. So, well, I mean, uh, you know, so he's... <laughs> yeah. Well, this is exactly what you've played and I'm going to write all the notes out for you. Okay? So this is what this guy did for the TV company. And uh, he was a really nice guy, I have to say. And very, very intelligent, and he could play exactly what Ronnie played, and write it all down so that uh, the public could understand it and learn to play it. So some months later, when I was back in England, um, my publisher said to me, "Off the back of the success that you've had in the last eighteen months, you desperately need to release a solo album." And I went, "Right, okay." He said, uh, so think about it. And I, so I sat down and sort of scratched my head a little bit and thought, hmm, I need a really good guitarist um, because I can't write the music. I'm just a vocalist and a melody writer and a lyricist. I don't write music as such. So my wife said to me, uh, well, why don't you bring Neil? And I thought, what a great idea. So I rang Neil and then Neil came up to Birmingham where I live and um and and stayed with us and when we and he sat down and he and, and he wrote an album like a, a a good dark melodic piece of music some of it was scrapped uh to start with and then he sort of shifted into more of my realms and uh and then we ended up with this album um called vital designs and then we uh we mixed it here with the the guy that um works for magnum mark stewart and uh, and then um, got it pressed and released through um, cargo distribution in London, and um, and then it drifted out into Europe, and and uh, and then we went and played it in um, in Norway with um, I took uh, Black Sabbath's keyboard player with me, um, Jeff Jeff Nichols, yeah, and. Uh, and I bought the other musicians I drafted in from Norway, and, uh, and then we, we went up to uh, Norway and played that live. And uh, So, yeah, and I, and I was really pleased with the record. To be honest with you, I haven't listened to it since then. So, you never do, because it's you're too busy doing something else, you know. 
It's, uh, but yeah. And of course, you've got uh, a fantastic cast of players on the record too, including uh, Victor Borg and Morty Black from TNT and Shy's drummer Bob Richards. Uh, do you have them in mind to play certain parts, or did you just start making phone calls to see who would show up? Yeah, I just picked up the phone and I said, "You want to come and play on this?" Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you just pick up the phone and uh, and they were they were like yeah 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 well uh, just just to send me the tracks and they go into their own studio and uh, play their own parts and then send the parts back home and and then you draft it all onto the mixing desk and um, and mix the mix the album basically. So because you end up doing backing vocals on so many different records, do you uh, have a studio at home and then? you know, send tracks through the internet and sort of coordinate that way? I've been doing that for many years now, to be honest. Um, well, I've lost track of, uh, of, um, of, of whatever the quantity is, but um, the China Blue, I mean, I've only ever met the keyboard player. He came and stayed here, Eric, Eric Ragnar, um, but I've never met any of the other members in the band. Uh, they're all in Los Angeles or wherever. And France, or sorry, Holland, um, you know, so, um, lots and lots of, I'm, I'm involved in about sort of six or seven projects at the moment, like in Italy and Greece and the States and Germany and, uh, well, admittedly, I have been to Germany and played with the band that I'm working on with there, but uh, all the other people, I've never, I've never met them. It's, um, you just get it on MySpace and on the email and, uh, before you know it, you're halfway through a record, you know. And do you have um, do you have any plans to record again with Neil, or do another uh, solo record in the vein of Vital Designs? Um, well, I mean, that's a really good question. I've got I have much hope to work with Neil again because we're very very good friends. At the moment, I've got about sixty tracks to record, and um, I'm very hopeful that Neil can get involved with some of that. He's moving out at the moment, actually, so he's a bit busy. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, he's a lovely guy and a very talented man. And he's got a little recording thing going on where he lives down in Salisbury. But, um, but if I have the chance to work with him again, I'll snap it up straight away, yeah. So does it look like, uh, in the near future, because he's so far away, it's not going to happen? Well, he's, well, well, well there's a, there, there is an upside to that. And that is that, He's just joined Shy. Oh, really? Oh, so he's the new member of Shy then? Yeah. So now he plays for Shy. So I'm talking. I'm talking to promoters. Well, I had to get him in, didn't I? I mean, come on, because the other guitarist wasn't sort of available when he should have been, and all the rest of it. He went on and on and on. And I said, "Well, I've had enough of this. Let's get Neil in." So Neil came up to um, to Birmingham, and we rehearsed uh, the live set for the concerts that we were going to play before Steve was ill. And he actually put his earplugs in, and he was still deaf two days later. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was that ridiculously loud, you know. But um, but no, Neil, he's, he's, he's very much involved in Shy, and um, he's actually going to be recorded. I'm, I'm working on the vocals for the new album now, and Neil will be finishing off the guitar parts that are undone um, before it gets mixed. So, you know, the, the, that in itself is a, is a really positive thing, and Neil is involved, so so I'm really happy about that. So is uh, is Ian Richardson still in the band then? No, he's the guy that got the kick. So it looks like we're not going to see a Siam reunion, at least in the near future then. Um, you know, I mean, I've been asked so many times to put this back together and take it out. I mean, Ian was the one guitarist... <laughs> well, I mean, originally the two guitarists were um, Chris Evans and, and, and Darren Horton, and they've both quit. Um, and um, then they were replaced by Ian Richardson and uh, Marcus Thurston. Marcus Thurston was a guy I found on the street. He lived he lived in a, a homeless place. Oh, wow. And he was a fantastic guitarist. And he's, then, he's since then worked with Paul Diano, um, but he's disappeared again. And... Um, well, I can't, I haven't been able to rely on Ian Richardson, so I can't tie those two together either. So I think that, I think the chances are pretty small, actually. And I, I think I, already anyway, I've got enough on my plate. Tony, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about a record that came out just a couple of months ago, uh, the new Last Dale album, uh, Screaming for Silence. How did you end up singing on this record? Well, the concert that I did 
when Tony Harnell was there in the north of Norway and TNT and Shy and Sam all did the same gig. Um, after the gig, and the sun was still up at four in the morning and everybody was pretty tired, um, this guy turns up and there's a big barbecue in his garden and, uh, and it was this guy, Lassa Dale. And I thought, okay. And he said, um, I'm a guitarist and I've written some things. Would you like to come and listen to it? And I said, well, yeah, sure thing, why not? So I went down to his house, which was just at the bottom of the hill, and um, and he put this stuff on, and I was like, wow, this is heavy shit. This is like Dream Theatre meets Queensryche, and right up, right up my street. <laughs> and he said, well, well, what do you think? I said, well, what do you want? He said, well, I want you to write all the vocals and do all the singing and, and everything else and finish it all off. And I'm like, this isn't going to be a small job, dude. And he said, no. Well, I'm not in any rush. I said, okay. So I came back to England again and um, put it all up on the computer and uh, sat there and scratched my head. They should be, I should have no hair left. I scratched my head that much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I thought, this is fantastic. Uh, and he'd only got programmed drums at the time. There was no live drummer on it. And he'd done it all himself. And I thought, this is just awesome you know um classic prog metal a yeah, very uh ingve uh, malmstein vibe to it yes yes I, 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 to, a, to a great extent i would agree with that but um it was a little bit more off the wall i think i thought okay right so i've got to start writing this colossal thing which is probably going to take me a year or something uh well it didn't it took me nearly two years and um he, he didn't want any love songs. He didn't want any "I love you, baby." Yeah, well, uh, he didn't want any of that shit. So he just wanted politics and religion and angst and <laughs> everything else. Thought, okay. So two years later, um, again we mixed it with Mark Stewart again in Birmingham, here, the Magnum guy, and um, which took eight months or something. And then he'd, and he put a live drummer on it from Oslo, which was a phenomenal drummer. I can't remember his name, but what a crazy guy. I mean, I've never had a drummer like it in my life. He's like uh, Keith Moon on acid. <laughs> you know, but absolutely right on the money. And um, and so there it is. And uh, I hope to God I never have to sing that material live. Because it will kill me. <laughs> Vocal acrobats. <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> oh, it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. It, it, it is a great record, uh, you know, considering the money he spent. I mean, this guy's a forklift truck driver. It's, it's amazing. You, the people you pull out of the woodwork for this stuff. <laughs> That's what he does. He's a forklift truck driver. And he's a phenomenal guitar player. You know, so you... These people come out of the woodwork, you know, and um, and when they come and they've got some money to spend, and you, know, you just don't know what to expect. <laughs> okay, uh, once once again, we got to go to a break, and then we'll finish this off with a nice long segment at the end. Is there a song you want to hear off the la- off the uh, Dale album? Off, off the Lasser Dale album. Yeah. Oh, a Shadow of Doubt. Oh, I love I love that one. That's a great that's a great song. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's got a, it's got. It's got the atmosphere and the melody, and it's got everything that I ever wanted out of that song, out of that album, I should say. Um, Tony, uh, where do you think the music industry is headed right now? Well, I mean, that's always a good question, isn't it? Because it changes every day. And um, the amount of emails you get from um, the music societies and the record companies that are changing their tack and the way they are approaching the business and the way you should... Uh, deal with them as an artist it's it's non-stop and um, you know I mean you can only sort of t- take a step back and deal with it from your own perspective and my perspective is that I have a lot of clients that I have to work for and, I, and lots of record companies that I know that will probably accept the product or, or reject the product it's a bit of a juggling act at the moment to be honest all going internet and iPod casts and, and all that sort of thing based, 
Well, but that's okay as long as you police it properly for your own good or for everybody else's good. It's 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 completely changed from what what it was twenty years ago when there was a a, a glut of money um, hanging around and everybody was just throwing at anybody who got any talent, whether they were going to get anywhere or not. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, now that's not happening at all. I don't know why quite why that changed. It was somewhere around the grunge time in the nineties, but now I think you've got to cut back to the chase, and that is. If you've got some talent and you write good product and you and you offer the product to viable companies now, then you're going to get the releases. You're not going to get the advances, but you are going to get the releases, and you have to follow it up and, and police it yourself. Uh, I think that's very important, and that's what I'm doing. Um, you know, I've got my own publisher. I've I've got various sites that release my material and sell it for me. I don't rely on record companies to pay me big, fat advances in their hope that I'll give them a great record. I'll get a nominal advance. I work my ass off. I write a, 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 what I think is a good record. They say, yes, they're happy. They release it. And then if they've got the balls to stump the money up to promote it and put the band on tour, then fair enough. If they haven't, and it's a pay-to-play situation, like it is a lot now, then they're only going to sell what they sell through their own web advertising. They're not going to sell it through live promotion. You know, and a lot of bands actually make more money out of merch than they do out of record sales, like Iron Maiden, for instance. You know, so it's um, it's a hard push. Um, but if you don't keep pushing, you're not going to get anywhere. So you've got to keep pushing from every angle you can. And I'm always pushing, you know. So, you know, I mean, a lot of the life exists on the Internet. Um, and uh, we have to resolve ourselves to that now because life has changed that radically. It's not like when we were kids, we used to go down the shop and see what was for sale and what we liked. It's not like that anymore. You know, it's it's like you've got to know what you want, and you've got to you, you can download it for a tenth of the price or ten percent of the price, and you've got what you want. So it's it's changed incredibly, um, which is a bit sad, really. But um, but also, I think we're more in control of our own art now, uh, and the companies are not. So now it means that you can uh, you're able to do a solo record. Well, that's quite right. Yeah. Or uh, <laughs> this this recent uh, opera record you're doing now. Well, that's cool, yeah. And, you know, before you probably wouldn't have been able to. Well, probably not, because I wasn't old enough to, to cope with the power of the performance. Uh, but but because I was taught as an opera singer when I was a child, uh, well, not a child, but when I was about 20 years old, uh, my teacher was an opera singer, so that's how I was trained. And it, I only went there because I suffered so much with losing my voice that I didn't know how to pace myself properly. Um, I had to do something about it. So I went to see a teacher and, um, and, and I was taught what the differences were between your head, your throat and your stomach, you know, and your chest. Uh, so I, the songs that I learned and loved at the time, I hadn't had the chance or, or the, the situation where I could actually sit down and have some spare time to to, re, to actually record those songs, but now I have, uh, and um, I have to say it's, it it feels as if it, it should have been the first and foremost thing that I ever did before all this rock stuff, because I get much more enjoyment out of it than any of the rock music, really. But that's just probably um, uh, nostalgia, I think. Yeah, it's just something that I, I haven't let out for 20 years. So, um, but, uh, I mean, <laughs> and it's such a challenge trying to sing Italian opera uh, that, uh, well, you can't let it go. I mean, if you, if you, if you can't step up to the plate and, and really give it your best shot, then you're not, you're not very good, are you? So, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta give it your best shot. And um, it's just another um, exertion, another uh, another outlet, um, something else. When you've got something in your system, you've got to get it out. 
and uh, I can't actually I can't wait to get beyond the microphone. <laughs> No, it could probably take me a couple of days anyway. So. Now, do you keep up to date with new music? Is there anything you're following uh, right now? It's very difficult. That's, it's Yeah, that's a very difficult question for me. And, um, you know, I mean, I watch some TV with my family in the evening and stuff, and uh, um, I've got a stepdaughter who's 22, and she brings things home that I think, well, that's great, and that sucks, and uh, that's bloody awful. And, uh, but I, I actually don't have the time to, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I was thinking about this the other day. I never turn the radio on because I don't have time. I've got too much work to do. And, um, so I would, that's a very difficult question for me to answer. I mean, I could drive the car down the road, I guess, and listen to the radio, but I don't drive the car around very much because I'm too busy in the recording studio. So um, I sort of pick it up off my space a little bit. I try my best to, to catch snaps of this and that here and there and what's going on and that. But most of the time, um, I'm either talking to you or I'm behind the microphone or I'm wiping my baby's ass. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't, I can't really give you a fair square answer on that one. I mean, I've been I've, I've been wondering about Guns N' Roses and Boston and Skid Row and and lots of other bands and Death Leopard and you know and I mean what they uh, the changes that they have gone through um, and Journey of course the changes that they've all gone through over the last couple of years I've heard I haven't listened to anything that's gone on whatsoever because I've had far too much work to do. If I'm not on the... Have you heard the uh, the new journey? Um, I've heard Arnell, which I thought was Arnell. <laughs> and I said to Tony, um, did you get the job with journey? He said, fuck off. I don't want that job. I went, oh, so it's not Arnell. It's Arnell. And he went, yeah, it's not me. And I went, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, hmm. Because I thought he would have been brilliant for that. Mm -hmm. But... Um, well, he, he, you know, I mean, you know, Tony is his own commander, and I don't think he'd probably work with Neil Sean that well. Really. You know, he's, he's, he's his own man, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, uh, so that was a bit of a mistake on my part, but um, but no, I haven't really managed to keep up with the changes of those bands because uh, if I'm not on the plane, then I'm, I'm behind the microphone. At the studio, so okay. Now to step away from uh, music entirely, um, what's a day in the life like of Tony Mills? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you're probably going to be shocked. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll tell you straight. Uh, I sort of wake up in the morning and around about six o'clock with my little four-year-old girl kicking me in the face, saying that she wants her breakfast. Okay. So that's. Uh, Righto, I better get up then. Uh, come downstairs and cook the breakfast, uh, while she watches the television. I'll sit and have a cigarette and a cup of tea and, um, sort of look out the window and see what the weather's doing. Log on the internet and see if I've got any email, which I've usually got about 200 emails that are complete rubbish. Uh, and some that are important, <laughs> but not very many. And then, uh, I'll take my daughter to school. And then I'll come back home, and um, I'll check the mail again, and then I'll open up the studio, uh, which is in the house, and uh, fire up the um, the Logic Audio system, which is the, the system that I work on. Look at the work. So you don't use Pro Tools then? No, I don't use Pro Tools. I use Logic 9, uh, the latest one on the Mac, which I've only just bought, which cost me a fortune. Uh, but I was getting way behind and I was becoming incompatible or incompatible with commercial studios sending them work. They couldn't read it because I'd got an old Mac. So I had to get a new one. I got no choice. And I only bought that about two weeks ago. So I'll fire that up and look at the workload. Um, consider what I've got to do. Uh, I don't really sing until about one o'clock in the afternoon because your voice doesn't wake up properly until then. Do a bit of laundry, a bit of vacuuming. Uh, take the dog out, uh, <laughs> clean up, 
then then I think about going back upstairs into the studio and uh, and then starting vocals, um, uh, which I do pretty much for about four or five hours a day, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, then I usually come downstairs, cook the dinner, pick the baby up from school, and uh, and then welcome the family home in the evening. That's a pretty regular day for me, actually. You into uh, you into sports at all? Uh, football? No, I used to be, but I had to um, have an operation on my spine, so I had to have all these screws put in my back and all this bloody stuff. So, uh, so I haven't been very good at sports for quite a long time. If you, if you try singing from your stomach and doing singing opera, oh, that's that's really good exercise, and that'll do me. I think I don't think I'm going to be running around too much now. I'm nearly fifty years old. <laughs> <laughs> I know we've talked a little bit about Siam, but I was wondering if you'd like to comment a little bit more about them. Sure thing. Uh, can you tell me how it all got started? How it started was um, a guy called Darren Horton, who was a rhythm guitarist in um, a Birmingham band called Trident. Um, he, he didn't sort of have any other sort of outlet for his... He was only a really a rhythm guitar player anyway. But he wanted to... Um, he wanted to put a band together, and this was pretty much just after I'd left Shy. So I thought, and I always got on with him very well. So uh, okay, come on down, and let's 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 record some bits and bobs and see how we get on. It was it was a bit like that really. Then there was another guitarist from he played in an American band actually. It might have been Felix or somebody like that. Hellion. Hellion. That's it. Chris Evans. Yeah, he turned up. And he only lived round the corner in Bourneville where they make Cadbury's chocolate. So we got on absolutely great. So then the three of us said, hmm, we need a, we need a drummer and we need a bass player. So then we turned up with Andy Faulkner, who was the bass player, who played for this crazy band in Coventry, which is just outside of Birmingham. And he was, he was just terrific rock and roll bass player. And he got his own studio as well. Uh, and then this, we looked around for drummers and we found this guy called Paniolotis Malaris. Paniolotis Malaris, yeah, that's pretty much his name. But he was, um, he was an illegal immigrant from Greece uh, and, uh, and he worked in a, a fish and chip shop. <laughs> <coughs> but he was a great drummer. But so we all sort of hooked up together and, um, and started playing gigs and tours and whatever in England. And writing and recording stuff. And, um, to me, it was really going somewhere, to be honest. It was, it was a very strong band. And the rehearsals were phenomenal. Uh, and then, after some, after about three or four years, I think, um, the guitarist Chris Evans, he, um, he was a very intelligent man. And he, he developed, um, you're not gonna believe this, but he developed, um, a concrete that you could lay on the ground, uh, that you could put on, um, oil spilt, oil spoiled ground, so that you could lay new buildings on, on ground that was, um, spoiled by, by, um, well, oil and, uh, chemicals or whatever. So he became a doctor of engineering in England. So he gave up music altogether. And now he's got his own, he lives down in the south of England, and, he, and all he has is a load of beehives. Man must really love honey. <laughs> you can't believe it, can you? And um, Darren, the other guitar player, he became uh, a guy that connects your gas. <laughs> <laughs> gas man, yeah. A gas fitter. And the drummer disappeared, so I don't know. <laughs> he, he didn't play on the, uh, the first record, did he? No, I used a session man on the first record called Rob. He was, uh, yeah, and he cost me a fortune. I can't remember his last name. He, he was just a session man that I've been, I've done a couple of albums with before, and he just came in and played the drums. And I'd got the, I'd got the the Greek guy into the studio, but he hadn't got the right drum timing. He couldn't keep the time properly, so I had to get a session man in. Typical drummer. Um, and um, get him just to play, it so we we got it. And then, then I had to teach the other guy from Greece to play in time, and so he could do the second album, and which he did eventually. Which the second album was actually my favourite album, Prayer. Yeah, it was an amazing um, record. Which, 
Yeah, I, I listened to that a lot, you know. And I mean, it's a long time ago now. I don't know what year it was, but it was mid nineties or something. Well, that's that's uh, that's the record I always tell people if they listen to Queensrÿche, they have to listen to Siam. And I've actually got a lot of people over the years who've said, you know, thank you so much for introducing me to this. <laughs> okay. Well, the thing is, I mean, working with Neil Kernan and then going to see Queensrÿche at the Hammersmith Odeon with Bon Jovi. Um, that was a big influence on us at the time, I think. And, and then, uh, going and, and when Queen's Rite released Operation Mindcrime, uh, Rage for Order and, and Empire, you know, I mean, that was such a shock because it was so awesome, all of it, uh, that, um, it undoubtedly had a great, um, influence on us all at the time. And, uh, and that's, but that's what music's about. It's not about ripping other people's music off. It's about being influenced and growing up and writing your own music in your own way. It's, uh, and that's what happened with Siam. But, and, but definitely a lot of the influence came from Queensryche. And we, of course, we've had that in every conversation that we've ever had with any reporter or radio guy or journalist or whatever. Don't you think it's a bit too Queensryche? Well, no. It's not. It, it's just enough. It's enough, actually. <laughs> and, and like, none of these are Queen's Rock songs. They've just all got a flattened fifth chord in the bloody in the bridge or in the chorus arrangement, so that it, so that it sounds like they play. You know, it's, <laughs> it's same guitar work. It's that, uh, it's that devil chord, <laughs> the devil chord that was never allowed to be played in church on an organ for the last two hundred years because it sounded like the devil. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about doing a third album, and we've talked about doing more gigs, but the logistics are not great. So, now what uh, what happened with the Language of Menace records? the uh, The original release was all broken up, and the songs didn't really seem to have any order. And then when I got the uh, the reissue from Phoenix Music, it it was like a concept record, like Operation Mindcrime or something that fit and made sense. I think um, the first one came out through the Zero Corporation in Japan. And the second one was released through Phoenix Music in England. Uh, and they put, like, video footage and all sorts of bits and bobs all over the... It was a two-CD package. The first version was actually where everything overlapped each other because it be, the intention was for it to be a concept album, a story. But I had a financer at the time. <clears throat> and after he'd spent like 20,000 bucks, I think he ran out of money or something, so he never got finished. So what happened then was, when the labels finally agreed to release it, what they did was they chopped it up, they cut it up, and changed all the song order and everything, and did it in their own way, which sort of didn't make any sense about what I was trying to write. So I got two releases. One with it in its original format, and the other that was completely chopped up and all the songs were separated, and even some of the songs were, were not included either. So there's, there are some songs that will never be released. So that's just one of those things. That's the business, you know. Was the uh, the David Bowie cover done afterwards? David Barry's track, yeah. Was that insisted on by the label? No, 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 no. I've always been a great fan of David Bowie. I, I absolutely, I, I've always adored him. In fact, he was the only reason I ever became a singer at all. Even though I never regarded him as a great vocalist, he was a brilliant songwriter. And um, it ain't easy from, which was from the album Ziggy Stardust in 1972 or 71 or whenever it was, um, was one of the songs that I aspired to record throughout my childhood, um, and I thought. Hmm, we could actually heavy this up and make it really kick. So we just did it. And, and it, to me, worked great. But, I mean, I, and I've recorded other Barry tracks since then as well. But, um, but that, that particular track from Ziggy Stardust, it was a very simple song. But it still had plenty of, you know, balls. So, um, no, no, it was totally my idea. Well, I mean, I've spoken to Mike Garson, um, who was Barry's keyboard player, and he thought it was great. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think I made the right decision there. That's, that's got to be quite the compliment, then. Mm. Well, he, he actually complimented me this week on one of my opera tracks, which I nearly had a heart attack about. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs>
you know, he's such an awesome keyboard player. Now, do you do you still keep uh, do you still keep contact with Andy at all? Um, well, he, he does a lot of work with um, like. So I'm just cracking a beer. <laughs> <laughs> he does a lot of work with metal bands like um, Bolt Thrower and bands like that. They sort of use his studio all the time, and um, then he goes out on tour with them and helps them out with the sound live and stuff like that. And, and I mean, he's had his studio now for like, well, um, what, 20 years, something? Did, did he, uh, did he end up recording the, uh, he, he was, he was the engineer on Prayer, wasn't he? Yes. And is, so he's still doing it now? Um, do you, do you do any work with him at all? Well, he's just, he's, I mean, he's, he's recorded the new Shy album. He re- in fact, he's recorded the last three Shy albums. And he's, he finished, even while I was in Norway with TNT, he recorded the whole of the new Shy album. And it's a fantastic job, I have to say. But it's it's all been all the files have been transferred to Birmingham now, which is only like twenty five miles down the road. Um, and now I'm working on it, uh, but I can hear the quality of the work that's been done. But I think he's getting tired. Um, he's got a family now, and um, and I think he might uh, he might call it a day pretty soon. So I got the best of the last from him. So we'll see how the new Shy album comes out, but I think it's going to be very strong. I mean, I'm on track three at the moment, and it's uh, it's it kicks ass. There's no doubt about it. So what what's so, next? What's uh, what's on deck from Tony Mills? I mean, I'm I finished. I've just finished an album. Um, I, I have to plug this because it's phenomenal. Um, well, I've got some very strange things in the pipeline, but um, but the album I've just finished in Munich. Um, well, in Nuremberg, in Germany, um, with what was um, a band called Frontline, um, but now it's called State of Rock. Um, it's coming out through AOR Heaven. Uh, the album's called um, A Point of Destiny. Uh, it's absolutely superb. And um, Robbie Bobel, the guitar player, is phenomenal. Uh, and it's going to be an AOR classic, I think. I'm really pleased about that. He comes out on the 23rd of January. Um, and I think they will be coming to England to play. So there's a good chance that we'll be performing in England next year. Um, I've already played with him in Germany last month. Um, Any advice for uh, musicians? Advice? Oh. You know, I mean, that's a very difficult question to ask any musician. Uh, and that is... I, do you know? I, do you know? I think one of the first things that I always used to say to people was make sure you get a good manager. I would never say that now. Mm-hmm. I, I've had three managers that have all ripped me off, and they all went to they all went to jail. <laughs> so I don't bother with that anymore. I stand on my own two feet. And you know, if I if I need some advice, I go get a lawyer. Yeah. And um and I'll pay the man, pay the lawyer. And, uh, take his advice and stand behind him because, um, then you don't get screwed. Uh, the music business, the, the music comp, the, the record companies, um, they become much smaller and a lot more reliability has, has really gone down to the artists themselves. And so they should grow up and stand on their own feet before they start getting involved with companies and agreeing to every, shitty little offer that comes on the table because that's not the answer the answer is to be aware of what you're being offered and uh, and really sort of um, and if you if you you're unsure or or, or you, you don't know how to go about approaching the, the offer or whatever it is speak to your lawyer you know and let the lawyer deal with it and pay the man mm-hmm. and then keep yourself safe you know because lots of people have been screwed and um, it's not a great thing, really. And it, the thing is about this is that if you've got any talent, you are susceptible to people coming along and going, hmm, you've got some talent, I'll pick you up, you know. Yeah. No, is the answer, actually. You won't pick me up. You will wait until I deal with the offer, and, and so does my lawyer and my accountant, you know. So that... People really just have to be more aware of what's going on. Since the internet has evolved, the world has become very much smaller. 
and people are on your doorstep before you know it. And uh, and so are the crooks and the, and the, the people that will take money from you. Just as much are, just as much are, but the people that are genuine that want to support you and as an artist and, and develop your career. So you have to be just as aware of one as the other. And, um, you know, forget the days of the big record contracts and, um, get your head down and, uh, and just be aware of what's going on. That is what I would advise other musicians to do. And I'm sure that the rest of them would agree with me. All right, Tony. Well, we're, uh, we're just about out of time here, but I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank you for sticking around for the full two hours of the show. Uh, very much appreciated. You're welcome. All right. Take care, man. See you Thanks later. Thanks again, Tony. Shut up. Shut up.